I'm Billy S, welcome back to Dark Souls Month, where every Wednesday I'll be posting a new Dark Souls themed video. Exploration is the true meat of any Souls game, and Dark Souls has a unique world even within the series that is interconnected and compact, constantly looping back on itself while providing a ton of biomes to explore. So let's rank those areas! My results are based on a few factors, such as the overall level design, enemy placement, optional content, and of course, how fun these areas are to go through, both from a first-time perspective and repeat playthroughs. I won't be taking area bosses into account, however, as I ranked them in their own list last week, which you can view by clicking the card in the top right corner. I want to see how the levels themselves stand on their own. So without further ado, let's rank the Dark Souls areas from worst to best. And remember, this is solely my opinion. We 100% will not share the same sentiments, and that's okay. It's common knowledge that From Software ran into a spot of rushed development towards the end of Dark Souls production, and nowhere was that felt more than in areas like the Demon Ruins. Beyond an absolutely gorgeous aesthetic, this area has none of the unique or interesting level layouts of the areas that came before. The route to the bosses is a straight circle, with no real deviation beyond heading out into the cooled off lava lake of Taurus Demon copy pastes for a Chaos Flame Ember, and later in the level, a burrowing rockworm hallway containing the large flame ember. Remember when embers were placed in relatively interesting locations? Not anymore! These two key items feel so lazily thrown into the world because they just had to go somewhere, right? That's like me throwing in a message to subscribe to Billy S. Over 90% of you aren't subscribed, let's rectify that out of nowhere. The enemy placement and design of this level is also sadly quite atrocious. I'm all for bringing back bosses as regular enemies in moderation, but this was straight up copy paste the whole way through. The only Taurus demon I can forgive is the one right before the fog gate because it's placed in an interesting location and will always charge you as you approach. The less I say about the Capra hallway, the better, but I appreciate you can actually have a sparring match with the Capra demon in a good arena for once. You get two progression bonfires in this level, the first requiring you to kill a rockworm. I like the idea of killing an enemy to access a bonfire, I just hate the rockworm enemy type. The second bonfire, though, is not needed. It's right before the centipede demon boss fight, but you literally just unlocked a shortcut back up to the Daughters of Chaos bonfire with the elevator at the top of the stairs. Uh, I need to move on. You can see why it's my least favorite area. I genuinely have nothing nice to say. <laughs> Gravity is the bane of Souls players everywhere, and nowhere do I think it's at its worst than with the Great Hollow. This optional area can be reached by climbing the tree in Blighttown Swamp and dispelling a pair of illusory walls. There are only two real reasons to visit this place, the area that follows and the Chloranthi Ring, which you can find near the main bonfire in one of the central trunks. Beyond that, this chaotic wilting tree is filled with dangerous jumps, hard to reach items, and way too many basilisks to count. I don't hate basilisks, contrary to popular belief. If they're placed in an interesting way, like in the depths earlier in the game, I can actually get behind them. But throw them into an area like the Great Hollow, where it's easy to get your character stuck on a wonky branch or some badly hitboxed ground, and you can find yourself in serious curse danger. On the positive side, I'm a big fan of the mushroom segment towards the bottom of the tree, because who doesn't love the little mushroom people? But the first two thirds of this level are just perilous platforming and irritating enemies that more often than not, I can't be bothered to deal with. This game does elevation based level layouts far better in other areas, I just wish the Great Hollow had more time to cook in the oven. There's really not much to say about the Valley of the Drakes. It's a transitional area that runs throughout the land of Lordran, having connections to Blighttown, Darkroot Basin, and the New Londo Ruins. Most players will find this area for the first time when escaping Blighttown, which feels absolutely fantastic when you open that door to New Londo and realize where you are. But most players on repeat playthroughs will just master key and use this area to get around to new places. That level of freedom is fun, and is actually this area's biggest positive, but that doesn't forgive the Valley of the Drakes for being extremely boring as its own level. Beyond the linear path along the chasm, you have a single undead dragon, and then a ton of drake enemy spam. 
I don't know anyone who would willingly choose to enter the New Londo ruins from this side, and I'm convinced these drakes only exist so there'd be somewhere to farm dragon scales for upgrade materials. If they're not throwing themselves into the chasm by mistake. On a note unrelated to the level itself though, I loved finding out that the Valley of the Drakes is actually the chasm that runs through the Undead Burg underneath the Hellkite Dragon Bridge. I fucking love when you can see other explorable areas from completely different locations in Souls Worlds, and that's the only reason Valley of the Drakes is 24 and not 25 or 26. Take everything I said about the Demon Ruins, and copy-paste it, like the developers did with all the enemy types here, and you'll get my thoughts on Lost Isolith. Nowhere was the crunch more felt than in a lava-filled lake with the severed back halves of various undead dragons. As someone who's experienced both the original game and its remaster, let's just be grateful we don't have the original lava glow effect anymore. You could sunbathe IRL with that light source. This area at least leads you in the intended direction with the various routes you can follow, which should get you up to the main temple without much issue. There is a hidden bonfire for players who want to save space, but be warned that boss run backing from this bonfire will force you to switch your rings every time if you don't want to wear the orange charred ring into the boss. Where I actually enjoy Lost Isolith is in the second half of the level. Despite the sheer amount of stone demon enemy spam, I really like the aesthetic and design of the main structure, inspired by Cambodia's Angkor Wat Temple. I wish the area had a few more twists and turns on the main path leading to the boss though, it does feel like there was more planned, and we know that to be the case. You get a cool NPC fight against a daughter of Isolith, and if you take the alternate path, you can either cross the massive bridge guarded by a respawning titanite demon, which leads you to Solaire and the Sunlight Maggot, or you can head underground, underneath the temple, to fight some Chaos Eaters with Siegmire. Just don't get grabbed, or... <laughs> the Tomb of the Giants, in my opinion, is quite the step up from our previous entries, and I actually enjoy traversing this level. Whether it's with the Skull Lantern or the Sunlight Maggot, making your way through Nito's Dark Domain can be fun. That is, unless you're going in with no light source, in which case I can't blame you if you rank this area last, just look how that ended up for me when I attempted it for this video. <laughs> My boyfriend actually had a playthrough where he came down to the Tomb of the Giants before getting the Lord Vessel, resulting in him having to climb his way back out. I wouldn't wish that fate on anyone. The enemies here are your standard beefy skeleton fare, with a dash of pinwheel and skeleton babies towards the end. I have a soft spot for the skelly dogs and the bone towers, the singular black knight can shove it though, and this was actually the first time I came across a vagrant in game. It has never happened before, and it made me absolutely sh** myself. <laughs> My favourite aspect of this level is easily the way you can see both Lost Isolith and Ash Lake from the start and end of the area respectively. For Lost Isolith, you can actually see the Demon Ruins Ceaseless Discharge Boss Arena, but if you look from the Demon Ruins for the Tomb of the Giants, you just see a wall, which absolutely devastated me. Another reason to hate the Demon Ruins. This is also where you find patches up to his main tricks, and clearing out his pit of enemies and working back around to him is quite satisfying. My only major complaint of the tomb is the position of the second bonfire. I think it would have been better placed at the entrance to the cave leading to Nito, overlooking Ash Lake, as opposed to in a tiny crevasse that most players were going to miss. I debated long and hard as to whether I should separate Upper and Lower Undeadburg, as in-game, they are considered one large area, but I've always played Dark Souls with the idea in my head that the Undeadburg and the Lower Burg were two separate locations. So yeah, you know what, my rules, my video, it's its own area for this. As its own area, the Lower Undead Burg is a transitional street that happens to have a boss fight. You have to deal with the assassin enemies, which will 100% parry new players, as well as everybody's favourite enemy type, <laughs> For the enemy selection alone, this area deserves to be this low on the list, but honestly, we're already reaching the point in the area rankings where I'm like, I actually like this place. 
Perhaps I'm just glutton for punishment, but getting absolutely wrecked by the assassin's AI, the dogs, and Capra have left me with a weird case of Stockholm Syndrome. It's a claustrophobic alley of a level that manages to tell an interesting story with just its enemy type and the environment with the burning flames and overgrown walkways. It also gives you access to the female undead merchant, who is one of two early game merchants who sell purging stones, and is the only one to sell various moss clumps which will come in handy as you head down to Blight Town. A large step up from the previous entries, the catacombs are where areas start to get good. And yet the level design of this twisting turning cavern can sometimes border on frustrating. I love how interconnected this area is as you make your way down, and there are tons of shortcuts you can take by falling if you know the routes. Do this area legit though, and you'll be faced with respawning skeletons that can be very, very annoying to deal with. You're introduced early on to necromancers before the first bonfire, which must be killed if you want to slay the skeletons. They don't respawn, but a couple of the necromancers are in very sneaky locations, namely the third necromancer who requires players to go out of their way down a side tunnel near the Dark Moon Seance Ring drop to find him. You may also meet Patches for the first time, and I had a bit of a glitch where after surviving his attempt to bridge murder me, he wouldn't move away from the lever, forcing me to reload the area and recomplete what I'd already done so that he would move away from the lever. What I didn't remember is that the catacombs has a second bonfire hidden behind an illusory wall right next to Patches. In my opinion, this is the most forgettable bonfire in the entire game and feels a bit unneeded. But I digress. You can also discover a blacksmith, though you'll have to do some irritating parkour to reach him, and in the remastered version of the game, that does come with a warpable bonfire, so that is worth it. You also get a path to the bone wheel skeletons and the boss fight at the bottom. You can also go join the Gravelord Servants Covenant if you feel so inclined, and of course beating this area gets you the right of kindling. So for an area you can accidentally stumble upon at the start of the game, there's a lot of important stuff here to find. Just do yourself a favor and come here after the Lord Vessel, because climbing back up is absolutely miserable. Another transitional area, Darkroot Basin links Darkroot Garden to the Undead Burg, Valley of the Drakes, and the start of the DLC. There's honestly not much in the way of content here beyond the giant hydra in the lake, the crystal golems wandering around, and the Black Knight found along the cliffside. But that Black Knight guards my future child, the Grass Crest Shield, which gives you a stamina regeneration buff by simply having it equipped. The Hydra is the high point of the area, and killing it feels really cool, even if the fight is often quite janky to actually complete, and the reward of gaining access to Dusk of Ulusil for magic users, and a secret back entrance into the Darkroot Garden Woods should also be noticed. I just love the extra touch that the ladder you climb for the shortcut back to Darkroot Garden is implied to be the same ladder you used to get down to Calamite's boss fight in the DLC. Mind blown. I just want to start this segment off by acknowledging that I think the Duke's Archives is a well-designed area with an interesting layout and progression, and the only reason it's so far down in my area rankings is purely because I just don't like going through it. Let me rephrase, actually. I don't like going through the main archive. The immediate first impression is bleak, starting with two iron boar enemies that feel so awful to fight in such tight quarters. The channelers who buff the generic enemies allow for the player to get one or two shotted by the various crystal hollows and archers littered throughout, and I have a personal vendetta against the channelers here because if you want to 100% Dark Souls, you need to farm them for their unique tridents which have a 1% drop rate. Farming for that weapon will make anyone hate running around the convoluted floors of this area to kill them all. The stair lifts that swivel around confuse me my first time, though in the most recent playthrough I realized they're a lot more linear than I thought, which was nice. Where we go from negativity to praise, though, is the prison. I think the set piece of being slain by Seath and locked in his prison, unable to warp out, is a fantastic moment. More of these games need to experiment with this concept, similar to Bloodborne's Hypogean Jail kidnapping. The maiden experiments littered across the tower are horrifying to see and fight, the haunting music that plays from the record player unnerves you, it does its job, and it does it well. 
My only complaint is that if you want a free Big Hat Logan and get the Firekeeper Soul at the back of the bottom cell, you have to run all the way here from the main archive, and it's quite a journey if you've respawned the area enemies. I could totally see people ranking this area much higher on their lists though, and I would be like, yeah, I get it. So, I hope you guys can respect my decision. I went back and forth for a while on whether Crystal Cave should be above or below the Duke's archives, but ultimately, I decided that I preferred the shorter experience it offers players. Yes, the platforming absolutely sucks, and if you don't know about the invisible bridges, you're not gonna have a good time. And yes, it's very easy to accidentally slide off platforms you think are stable, oh no. but it's so pretty. In terms of aesthetic, nope. this is one of the strongest areas in the game. It has a nice variety of enemies with the crystal golems, some docile moonlight butterflies, and of course, the giant clams. These guys are good to farm because they can drop purging stones, which are useful for the boss fight against Seath. You can tell though, like most of the endgame areas, that the level layout isn't quite as interesting to run through with a lot of linear paths and a simple large space before the boss corridor. There just feels like so much potential that was sadly unrealized. The Chasm of the Abyss for me is similar to the Crystal Caves in that both areas don't really have much to offer in terms of actual level design and rely heavily on their aesthetics to sell their visions. The reason why Chasm of the Abyss ranks higher is simply because there's no bullshit platforming to deal with. You enter from a derelict broken cell, emerging into a dark chasm. It's pitch black, but you can see the path ahead of you, and in the distance you may catch red, burning eyes watching your every move. It's genuinely creepy seeing the enemies of this area highlighted like that. You also get the Dark Bead spell here, iconic, best magic in the game, we stan, and then you see the Humanity Sprites. These guys are creepy, they do a lot of damage, and they certainly make you think. You can also follow the spirit of Alvina and rescue Sif down here near an elevator leading back to the Royal Woods. Do this and you can summon him for the final boss fight. I guess I wish there was a little more to the level though, as after you cross the bridge to the far side of the chasm, it's a simple cave with one split path leading to the boss fog. And it's intimidating, that fog gate is massive, but I wanted more from this area. I love that you can see Manus hanging out down there though. People are gonna hate me for this. The Undead Parish is such an iconic location for so many Souls fans, and yet I just don't connect to it in the same way I do the area preceding it. Something about the progression, the enemy placement, and the level design, while textbook Dark Souls, just doesn't really speak to me. I wasn't a big fan of the Ironborn mini-boss, though I did enjoy using alluring skulls to backstab it in the good old days. I don't really enjoy the basement room filled with basic hollows, and the upper half of the church with the channeler is also a mixed bag for me. The Boulder Knights are really cool though, I like the segments on the walkways with them, especially that one ambush, and I can't fault the Undead Parish for having good old Andre of Astora, who doesn't want to see us go hollow, as well as your first Titanite demon to fight. There's a Firekeeper Soul waiting for you to claim it in the church, as well as the lower Undead Burg Key by the large gate in the street. And of course, the Undead Parish has one of the most iconic shortcuts in Souls history, taking the elevator back down to Firelink. For a first time playthrough, the Parish really helps to teach the player about overcoming tougher enemy types, watching out for ambushes, navigation, the works. If Undead Burg was the follow-up to the tutorial, the Parish is your main exam. But on repeat playthroughs, I feel this area loses steam and doesn't have a defining feature that makes me think, oh yeah, that's why I love the Undead Parish. But as said, it's a well-designed area that I can see an argument for being much higher than I've placed it. Blight Town is very difficult to rank, as depending on the day, I will either hate or adore the level structure. On a first playthrough, this level is unforgiving, with extremely tanky enemies at the start that will knock you off the rickety wooden platforms without a second thought, a series of fast-moving smaller enemies, doggos that spit fire, and the non-respawning toxic dart blowers. Entering from the depths, you have a rough trek down to the swamp floor, and if you don't know your way, it can be very confusing to navigate. There are so many ladders, drops, platforms, it can become overwhelming. But on repeat playthroughs, I find I enjoy this area more and more. 
It's a test of my skill and how far I've come from my first playthrough when I can be bothered to actually approach from the intended entrance, because let's be real, the temptation to master key down the water wheel and skip hell is pretty much unavoidable unless you need a specific item. The swamp can be frustrating if you don't have the rusted iron ring from the revisited Undead Asylum, but with that ring, it becomes genuinely fun to explore. Taking out boulder giants, creepy leeches, flying mosquitoes, and chaos bogs, it's quite fun. I don't even mind the poison, I just wish you could move at normal speeds all the time. It culminates in a fairly intimidating path to Quaylag's domain, which is this creepy webbed church taken over by the boss. Blight Town is like Marmite, you love it or you hate it, and because for me, to enjoy Blight Town I need very specific caveats, like a ring to make the swamp bearable or an alternate entrance, I just can't rank it in the upper half of my list despite how iconic it is, for better or for worse. New Londo Ruins is one of my favourite areas that tells a story solely with the environment. A dark, dimly lit, ruined city inhabited by ghosts, with only a single resident waiting to hand the chosen undead the seal to the lower city. The simple fact that you need a transient curse to even damage the enemies in the first half of this level is daunting. But there's a Firekeeper soul right at the start for those daring enough to grab it at the beginning of their playthrough. The ghosts are hit or miss, I like them, and I like the potential for surprises that you can get in tight corridors or the outside areas. But we have to talk about the ghost house that is just brimming with the fuckers. I don't understand why every ghost in the level feels the need to torpedo towards you when you enter, but at least if you're transient cursed you take less damage from the ghosts and can push your way through. Why I really love New Londo though is when you break the seal and lower the water level, revealing the horrors lurking beneath. Dark wraiths and masses of souls await you, these creatures locked under the water for a reason. Dark wraiths are intimidating, but parryable as long as you can aggro them one at a time, assuming you don't get grabbed and get your levels sucked. The masses of souls don't respawn, but they can create floating skulls that act as proximity mines if you stray too close. I just like that the lower half of New Londo is its own level with its own pathways to explore, tons of extra items to find, and you can shortcut down there from much earlier on in the main level to skip some of the more tedious enemies. And of course, I actually have to shout out the boss arena. I didn't want to include the abyss as its own entry because it's just one area, but dropping from the tower into this inky black darkness, not knowing what you'll find down there, only to realize there is nothing. The four kings are bonfire and that's it. I just find this area fun. It only loses points because there are no bonfires in New Londo itself which is frustrating because you're constantly taking the fire link elevator down because nobody's using the bonfire at the other side of the bridge in the Valley of Drakes. Get real. The tutorial area of Dark Souls, the Northern Undead Asylum does its job in teaching the player well. You start with a broken weapon, realize it doesn't do good damage, you make it to your first bonfire, iconic, that is the moment. You fight your first boss and end up fleeing into another corridor, which locks you in so you have to complete the tutorial to progress. You get a shield, chase an enemy, get your fixed up weapon, learn about ranged attacks, then get bowled in the face. You're taught that you should always proceed with caution because you never know what traps could await you in the land of Lordran. Oscar grants you the Estus Flask and the way to the top balconies of the asylum where you handle a few extra enemies before a boss door. I like that you can also go to the right and take on a slightly harder enemy at the start of the game. It doesn't give you anything, but it's simple practice for parrying. And you see the door behind it remains locked, which contains the blessed rusted iron ring behind it. Outside, after beating the boss, you have the crows for trading, and then it's off to Lordran. But if you come back here via the crow later in the game, there's an extra boss fight in the main hall, two black knights hold up where you got your shield and in your starting area, as well as the peculiar doll needed to get to a future area on this list. You're taught all the basic tricks and tips as you leave, so when you come back later in the game, you feel powerful. It's just a wonderful tutorial area with a lot of charm and a lot of nostalgia. So it makes number 12. Just missing out on my top 10 areas of Dark Souls 1, the Kiln of the First Flame is an area that focuses on aesthetic over substance. 
but this is one of the rare times where I can actually accept that. You're at the end of the game, you're ready to link the fire, you walk down a gorgeous stairway past the ghosts of Black Knights, and then you emerge in this ashen wasteland. The Black Knights patrol, which you can defeat for upgrade materials, and aside from one or two items scattered around, it really is a straight path to the boss arena. The crumbling structures and the grey tones denote a kiln that is on its last legs, desperate for someone to reignite the flames. I just like looking at the skybox and viewing the scenery, seeing how far this land stretches. I do wonder where the kiln is in relation to Lordran in lore. If anybody in the comments knows, please let me. I always assumed it was under Firelink somehow, but that wouldn't make the most geographical sense when we can see the sky. My favourite location, of course, though, is the boss arena itself. This ashen bowl where the only light is Gwyn himself. It's almost eerie when you're standing there alone, having won the fight, seeing no flames and a simple bonfire ahead of you. And seeing the area alight with flames if you choose to link it adds so much colour and vibrancy to this ancient kiln. If there were more level to this area, it would have broken into my top 10, but what's here is satisfying and more than fun to play. Thank you for watching this episode, guys. This video has gotten a bit longer than I expected, and I will be breaking my top Dark Souls areas into two parts. So tune in next Wednesday for my 10 to 1 favorite Dark Souls areas. My social links are on screen now. Please leave a like, comment, and subscribe, and feel free to follow me where you feel comfortable. Shout out to all of my patrons on the left there. You guys are the reason why I can continue making these videos. You are awesome. Thank you so much. And I will see you guys next week. Bye-bye.